So my name is Doug Hanks. I'm the uh, director of architecture here at Juniper. Uh, my team, we basically build the hardware and the software for our switching products here at Juniper. And now what I want to talk about is go a little bit deeper on this EVPN VXLAN use case and kind of give you an idea of what that looks like and how it works. Um, so there are, at a high level, I want to focus on two use cases. The first one being DCI. Um, so obviously, when you take a look at DCI, you want to do a couple of different things. Uh, obviously, you want to exchange data between data centers, but you want to provide both layer two and layer three transport between different data centers. Not just two, but multiple. And on top of that, you need data separation, isolation, and obviously redundancy when it comes to your links and your nodes. So pretty simple. And now, how does EVPN apply to this? We have a lot of different options, so I'll post the most uh, common. Uh, first of all, we start taking a look at this, you typically already have a WAN in place. It may be a WAN based on MPLS running a layer 3 VPN at your enterprise site. And what I'm showing here is a simplified DCI segment wrapped around upon itself. So basically this box over here on the left, this is your first data center, and over here is your second data center. And these MXs here are the edge routers. So I just kind of show it loop back on itself, so I'll be showing different options here. So the first option, we assume there is a existing MPLS network back here that you guys own and you manage, or you buy it from someone else such as AT&T or Verizon or what have you. So this already exists, and this is going to be a layer three VPN that you buy. Now the first option is, well, if I want to use eVPN and VXLAN to do a layer two DCI across the data center, how do we do that? Well. If we make the assumption that a QFX 10,000 is in your data center somewhere, regardless if it's IP fabric, fusion, or whatever, it really doesn't matter. But what we do is we can basically start and stop a VXLAN tunnel on the QFX 10,000. And because we encapsulate that traffic, we can just basically send it over the top on that layer three VPN that you guys already have in your network. So we kind of call this a over the top DCI because it's going over the top of layer three VPN. So it's pretty easy to implement because it requires no fundamental changes to your WAN. So that makes sense to you guys? Yeah. Okay. The second one is a different flavor of this. So if you want to go in there and modify your WAN and say, well, I'm not happy with just a layer three VPN. I actually want to change my WAN architecture to natively support eVPN. You can do so. So then what happens is that you have a MPLS data plane with an eVPN control plane. So now you can natively do layer two and layer three traffic on your uh, WAN connecting into your data center, we use a different data plane encapsulation. So in this case, it would be VXLAN going back into the data center, but still using that fundamental control plane element EVPN. So we have the stitching of VXLAN and MPLS happening here on the edge router. So this is more of a uh, MPLS option A if you're coming from the SP world. But the benefit is that it's EVPN everywhere, and uh, the downside is going to require more planning and, and, and basically changes to your network. But the upside is that you get all the benefits of MPLS. So you want fast reroute, traffic engineering, yada, yada, yada. You can do so with EVPN now in your WAN. So we've got two different models here. Uh, the easy way <laughs> and the uh, other way, which requires more planning and more work on the WAN itself, but more benefit. Does those two options make sense for the, the eVPN DCI? Okay. Uh, the other option is a bit more interesting. This might be more of a, uh, a, a branch model where you might not have a traditional WAN. Maybe it's just going across the internet or an IPsec tunnel. And basically what I'm showing here is that we're getting away from MPLS on the WAN side and we're going right to VXLAN which can ride on top of IP. So if you have two branch locations going across the internet, you can basically just tunnel this across the internet, for example. And this is VXLAN uh, through and through. So from data center to your edge router, and edge router to edge router would be VXLAN. And again, obviously eVPN all the way through as well. So you get both L2 and L3 between these two locations. Um, and the last option is 
probably the most simple. Uh, it's just a back-to-back -back connection. Well, what if I have, have an edge router or a peering router? How can I do it? Uh, you just directly uh, connect them. Uh, very easy to do. There's no MPLS. Um, you typically need dark fiber for this, but um, again, it would be eVPN with uh, VXLAN natively. <clears throat> So again, four options for DCI when it comes to VXLAN and eVPN. We can do so on our uh, QFX 10,000 here. Um, our next use case is basically the eVPN VXLAN fabric, which is basically focusing more internally in the data center. So if you want to zoom in and take a look at how this works, basically what you see is inside the data center you have, let's say, bare metal servers, or they could be virtual servers too. You get your storage, so on and so forth. And then everything will be connected uh, through this EVP and VXLAN fabric. And I'm going to give you some more details on what this actually looks like. And then again, we, I mentioned we, we orchestrate and manage this day to day with OpenCloth. So what happens, I'll start peeling back the, uh, the covers here. So we see a spine and leaf type of topology. Obviously, uh, we have our bare metal servers uh, down here, uh, BMS. And what's going to happen is that we'll create a full mesh on the spine and leaf. And the next step is that we want redundancy uh, to the servers, whether it's dual homed, which I'm you know, showing here, or multi homed. So six way over there. So we've got two different vari uh, uh, variations of the access layer. Now this is where we get a bit interesting. So now we start talking about the VXLAN components. And here we'll do something called VXLAN L2 gateway. So whenever we receive, receive an ethernet or an IP packet from our bare metal servers, we'll encapsulate that into a VXLAN header. And uh, if we want to switch between two of these guys, obviously we can send it from any L2 gateway to any L2 gateway. And the question kind of comes up, well, what if you want to do VXLAN routing? How does that happen? Uh, because generally on these type of uh, access switches, they can only do L2 gateway and not the L uh, layer three gateway. So what we've done here in the spine, I've made the assumption that this is a QFX 10,000, which you kind of see over here, uh, it's the chassis. So we can do both L2 gateway as, as well as layer three gateway. So it's kind of like a universal uh, gateway. You, you can kind of think of that. So it'll do MPLS, IP, Ethernet, VXLAN, whatever. It really doesn't matter, both L2 and, and L3. So now what happens is we can create a bunch of tunnels uh, going between any of our access switches going back into the spine. So whether we want layer 2 or layer 3 uh, routing, we can do so. And the benefit is that um, the underlay itself, it's built upon an IP fabric using BGP, standard protocols, extremely resilient. Any of these nodes go down, it's just a switch going down that happens to run BGP. It's not going to impact anyone else. Again, it's just using very you know, standard open uh, protocols. Uh, the next piece is we start talking about the tenant separation. How does that generally happen? So if I zoom in on one of these switches, um, you know, whether you want to have application separation or tenant separation, it's the same fundamental tools. So what we have here, we start carving out VRFs, and I call this T1 for a tenant one. We'll do the exact same thing for tenant number two, and this is going to be a layer three VRF as well as a layer two uh, VRF. And basically we start carving out bridge domains or VLANs. And we give them a, uh, a VNI, which ties back to the VXLAN identifier. And we also give it a mapping to a VLAN ID. So that way we make the mapping from Ethernet to VXLAN through this mapping of uh, IDs. So that was uh, so obviously you can do the translation between the two. So if I need to do a migration or whatever, you, you can terminate it. Yeah, and we got do really like funky stuff too. So if traffic comes in here on VLAN ID one, we can send it back out over here on 55 or right, you know, right. whatever you guys want. Okay. So via normalization, I guess you'll call it. So we do the exact same thing in VRF number two, and <clears throat> I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm showing uh, sequential uh, VLAN IDs on purpose because the um, the namespace for VXLAN is global. It's basically 1 to 16 million. You can't overlap those. That's why I showed that as global. Um, however, we can have overlapping VLAN IDs, though. Because we make a layer 2 VRF, we can have overlapping VLAN, ID, or, sorry, VLAN IDs. So for example, um, I put here for bridge domain 1, VLAN 1, I can have the same VLAN ID 1 
in tenant two as well as tenant one. So in that case, that's going to be a local namespace. We have overlapping VLAN IDs. Um, so the next question is, how do you route between these guys? It's going to be a IRB interface or an SVI. And we connect these up into the IRB. And we basically do this in the uh, control plane for policy enforcement. So if you want to say that tenant one can only route and switch within this one VRF, you can do so. It'll happen at line rate in the data plane. Now, if you want to say that tenant one can also talk to tenant number two, we'll make a control plane adjustment in uh, BGP, and it'll say, well, for these particular NLRIs, whether it's an IP slash mask or an IP slash MAC address, we'll allow that traffic to propagate between these two different VRFs, and therefore, these tenants can talk to each other. And the exact same thing can happen going out to the internet or the WAN. We just explicitly allow or deny what traffic can go in or out of that network. Now, are you guys doing any kind of distributed firewalling across down at the access layer, or is that a um, we have the you ACL support, but okay. we, we don't have um, stateful firewalls okay, built so into this natively. North, northbound. But what we could do is the virtual SRX, and we could put it in the, in the compute gotcha. clusters and then enforce it like that. Cool. Just not Hyper-V. Yeah, just not Hyper-V. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so does this make sense to you guys? I'll, I'll pause here. Now back to the, the virtual, is that a kernel module or is that an actual VM that's going to run? It'll be a virtual instance. I will work. let my uh, friend speak to that. I am not okay. well versed in the world of virtual SRX. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I'll talk about it, but it's actually a VM. Okay, a but it's not a kernel module, it's just mm -hmm. so it could be motion between and, okay. Okay, cool. Repeat. Yeah, so it's a, actually, a, it's not a kernel module. I'll talk more about it. It's actually a VM that we instantiate for a virtual firewall. Okay, cool. Um, I'll speed up a little bit. Uh, there are two options when building out these VXLAN fabrics. You can do it uh, in a three-stage topology, or if you kind of grow beyond the capacity of the spine, we can go into the five-stage as well. A lot of different design options, but we do support both depending on your scale and your needs and the amount of servers that you need. So. Um, on the next bit, I do want to give you a bit more of the fundamentals. We already talked about the different VRFs already, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, what I'm actually showing here on the dotted line is that layer two uh, VRF. And then we have our bridge domains, and I talked about the IRB already. But the piece I want to uh, show you is the interaction between the spine and the leaf. And there's an assumption here. The assumption is that this is going to be a, uh, a top of rack switch based on the Broadcom T2 chipset that only does VXLAN L2 gateway. And what that means is from an overlay perspective, it's layer two only. However, you know, the underlay is layer three, but when it comes to EVPN and the overlay, it can only do L2 functions. So you're not going to see the repeat of your VRFs down here. You'll see a global default virtual switch instead. And what happens is that will migrate our L2 components that are that is up here into the switch. Because again, from an overlay perspective, it's only layer two. So we just replicate those bridge domains. <clears throat> and now what happens is obviously we'll put those VTEPs into the network itself. And then uh, we'll extend the, uh, the VNIDs to match those bridge domains. So what happens is whether it's L2 or L3 traffic coming in from your servers will encapsulate that. It'll get tagged into the correct VNID and it'll basically get uh, routed up here or we can natively switch uh, in this switch as well. And when it comes to the routing side, you may ask, well, where's my default gateway from my server? And it actually exists up here as the IRB. And if you imagine you have multiple spines, whether it's 2, 3, 4, 16, 32, whatever it is, this is actually an anycast gateway. And by using eVPN, we don't need to have that, you know, dot two, dot three kind of scenario. Um, it's all just dot one for your default gateway. And we keep track of the, uh, the MAC addresses, the synchronization and MAC learning through eVPN. And you <laughs> caught me, I know. <laughs> so I'm thinking, so if I, if I have, going back to a virtual environment, if, I, if, if, if I'm in one rack and I hit my, my tour at my leaf and I'm on the same host and I'm going to a different subnet, whatever, going to get into another network, am I going to 
be able to go straight up to my leaf and then back down as my gateway because it's any cast or am I going to go back up to my spine? Right. So what happens is if, if you get a server down here, like you said, plugged into this leaf and you want to route to a different bridge domain, what's going to happen, you're going to ARP for your default gateway, right. which exists which is up here. Up there. And it's going to say, oh, your default gateway exists on this VNID. It's going to travel up here. It's going to respond to the op request. It'll get the packet. It'll route it up here and send it back down to the leaf in that case. And that's because this particular leaf is based on the Broadcom uh, Trident gotcha. 2 chipset. And then when I get into the virtual, and you'll probably go over this as well, oh, yeah. does that change that scenario when I'm doing the virtual? Will, will it actually, will it at the host layer say I'm going from this VM to this VM, even though they're, they're on the same host, Mm -hmm. Am I still going to go back up to my spine, back down, or with the virtual edition, will I stay on that host and route east-west? So again, if, if it's within the same host and you have virtual SRX instantiated, and if it's seeing the traffic, then you can it will provide all the firewalling It'll services. It'll do it within right? the host itself. Within that host. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So you, you brought up a little earlier about developing your own chipset. So obviously, I guess this came out of the fact that you can't do layer 3. Um, VTAP routing with the uh, Trident 2. Right. Um, so are you moving to a Jericho chipset or your own chipset in the near future? And, and where are you going to put, because obviously you're using this through the default gateway extended community through VPN, but you know, when you move off to your own functionality, are you going to bring your default gateway down on layer three on the leaf switches? Is that your plan? Yeah, so we, we have a, a pretty extensive roadmap when it comes to uh, the access switches. Um, if I, I think the next, I want to show you, uh, it's a few slides ahead. So the answer to the question is um, on, 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 the, on the access switches, we tend to go with emergent silicon just because it's, 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 it's good. Um, when it comes to the spine, we had some challenges where we wanted to solve some of the hosting problems. And the current chipsets, um, when we started developing the system, they, they couldn't do it. So we had to make our own in-house silicon. And that's the Juniper Q5 chipset. So that was where we could route, switch anything, whether it's VXLAN, GRE, NVGRE, or MPLS, we could do so in that chipset. And we, we keep that chipset in the spine of the network, and then merge silicon in the access part of the network. But um, obviously, Broadcom's going to have a T2 Plus chipset uh, very soon that'll do VXLAN routing in the access layer. So then we could uh, we can, we can uh, modify the same architecture, but then do the local routing on the access switch as well. So we got a lot of different options. So you know, assuming there's a lot of address families in here, a lot of DNI to VTEPs, uh, do you do like a, a zero touch provisioning so that because I mean, when you scale this thing out really wide, I mean, I can imagine there's a lot of configuration. Yeah. So do you have a ZTP that you use that'll grab all the address families, everything? Yeah, I, I can show you how that works. Um, basically, as you just described, you have different topologies and you have a lot of interface assignments, a lot of the control plane that you mentioned, as well as the, the VXLAN configuration bits. Um, and basically, how do you automate this? Uh, our answer is the open class. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no? Yes? No, no, it's, it's okay. nice. It's, it's always nice in a presentation when you ask a question. It's, ah, you know, okay. Next slide. Next slide, I guess. <laughs> I guess it's going good. Nice. Okay. So, yeah, we have tools to completely automate this for you. It, right. uh, I agree. It's extremely difficult to do it by hand. And most people, it's like, oh, yeah, I'll get an Excel spreadsheet and go do this. <laughs> or if I'm savvy, I'll get, like, a little Perl script and, like, use that output to make a spreadsheet. And it's like, no, let's just make a real program to do this. And most sh shops may not have resources to do that. And we, we do. And we want to give that to you guys for free. So that's why I made it open source and freely available. Now, do you guys integrate, um, again, this may not be valuable or not, but um, integrate with any, like, IPAM, like, InfoBlocks, anything like that as far as being able to automate some of that uh, not, DNS, not anything like that? with this. Yeah. Is there a need for it? I mean, is there really? I don't know. Um, honestly, this will do it. For you, it'll do it. For you kind of tell it your starting blocks and what sure, you're for in your namespace, sure. and it'll extrapolate that. But for if you. I wanted to, you know, tie that in to, and yeah, tie it in, automate at a higher level, maybe. Don't have that today. Okay. Yeah, sorry, man. <laughs> I, I am I'm curious. Just, um, I might have asked this the last time uh, I heard about this, but um, you guys obviously are not opposed to working with Ansible uh, for obvious no, reasons. No. Um, 
And I know you know a lot of us have explored using Ansible for doing these kind of physical and virtual provisioning tasks. Right. So uh, just I guess from a strategic perspective, this is a lot of investment for, from an engineering perspective to do this dedicated library. Um, why not just leverage existing tools? Why write your own tool, that kind of thing? Well, a lot of the functionality um, doesn't exist in Ansible. A lot of the technology that we had to do, we actually thought at first, like, oh, this would be trivial. Mm. We'll just go write some uh, Python libraries, do some calculations. But as we got into the weeds of it, we actually learned that the challenge was actually quite complex. We actually have like two patents on how to do a lot of the calculations on building IP fabrics, VXLAN fabrics, and so on and so forth. And that just didn't exist in a framework like Ansible, obviously. Oh, for sure. It's, it's more but focused on doing. I, I'm doing. curious the calculations that you're, you're talking about. Uh, well, we take namespace, whether it's BGP namespace, IP namespace, route target namespace, whatever. Yeah. And that has a, a lot of interdependencies. And the outcome has to be absolutely perfect for this to work. And the interaction of those namespaces and the uh, carving out of tenant namespaces is quite complex. So that was the logic that we had and we want to provide that value as opposed to you know, saying, oh, Ansible, go do this for us. But we want to use Ansible as the go do it tool. And we actually have, um, well, we did a demo the other week with Ansible plus OpenCloss to go build this out as well. So we got oh, a lot perfect. of yeah, different options on how to do this. That's cool. Yeah.